Again, uh, we say happy Sabbath and blessed Sabbath to everyone. This is uh, Gospel Sounders, Kenya, uh, with you in this Sabbath fellowship. And uh, we are at our midday presentation, where actually we are continuing with uh, our series on justification. And today we are dealing with the uh, number nine in the series, Justification Part Nine, Sanctification How, by our brother, Eric Omondi. And so uh, I would like to welcome everyone. And uh, I pray that uh, the Lord will continue guiding us in uh, everything. And at the end of the day, that uh, we shall move closer to him in uh, our spiritual life. I'll just, uh, as we go through this uh, presentation, I'd like to bring out this quote before Brother Eric starts uh, the presentation. As we welcome others who are joining in by Facebook, via YouTube, and uh, whichever platform, I'd like to read this as we start uh, our presentation. The danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan will work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. The law of God has been largely dwelt upon and has been presented to congregations almost as destitute of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his relation to the law as was the offering of Cain. I have been shown that many have been kept from the faith because of the mixed, confused ideas of salvation, because the ministers have worked in a wrong manner to reach hearts. The point that has been urged upon my mind for years is the imputed righteousness of Christ. I have wondered that this matter was not made the subject of discourses in our churches throughout the land when the matter has been kept so constantly urged upon me and I have made it the subject of nearly every discourse and talk that I have given to the people. There is a, a quote from uh, Ellen G. White from the book, uh, from the compilation Faith and Works, page 18, paragraph one. And so I'd like to invite uh, Brother Eric to pray and take us through the presentation Justification by Faith, Part 9, Sanctification, How. Welcome, Brother Eric. Yeah, thank you, Brother Sami. Uh, I'll request that we pray, then we get immediately into the study for this time. Let us bow wherever we are so that we can pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are before you. Thank you for having guided us, Father, for a whole week, Father. Even as we worship you this Sabbath, we pray that you will be able to forgive us in areas in which we might have gotten uh, acts and words out of us, Father, that are not in accordance to your will, and that you will be able to continue transforming us, Father, even by the building of the Spirit. Thank you for the session that you have had in the morning. May you be with us throughout this session, Father, and the remainder of the sessions for this Sabbath, for this our prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. So, like uh, Sami has uh, said, the title of uh, the study that we want to have this morning is uh, Sanctification. How? And uh, remember, these are just aspects of the whole theme that gospel sound us uh, so fit to have us go through. That is of uh, overcoming sin and justification by faith. So we keep looking at it from different angles so that by the time we finish, maybe we'll have a whole uh, a wholesome understanding of what it actually entails and that we might be able to experience it as uh, we are required to. 
So we want to look at how we are sanctified. And uh, by sanctification here, we mean the generic um, um, uh, definition that we are used to, that uh, we have justification and then we have sanctification. That we, after justification now, as we live, that is justification, that is sanctification, where we grow uh, into, in, in, in Christ, in the image of, of Christ. But we've seen some texts that actually show a different thing from the quotes that we've read from the spirit of prophecy and also the Bible that although there are terms that are technically used to refer to different aspects of uh, this package, because we are seeing that it is a package, you cannot separate it into uh, experiences that are distinct and separate one from the other. But it is an experience that has a beginning, yes, and it has to continue the same way that it began, like we want to see in some of the uh, quotes that we want to look at. They will be quoting extensively from the book Steps to Christ, of course, and Desire of Ages and other books. Even as we look at what the commentary is on some of the texts from the scripture that we want to look at uh, on this topic of sanctification or sanctified, how? And the question that we are asking is how, I mean, what, what is the part that we have to do in this aspect of sanctification? What, what is required of us in this thing called sanctification? We've seen that the Lord is the one who is the, the prime mover. We are justified by what? By faith and justification means we so means even more than just forgiveness. Like David prayed in the book of Psalm 51, it includes also a, a cleansing. So we, we want to continue in the same line by looking at this question. What, what does the Bible say? How does the Bible say we accomplish these things that it refers to in this process uh, of sanctification? So as usual, you'll find that we also read some texts and we read them uh, out of context or we leave some other portion and then we come up with these uh, differentiations of this process of, of salvation that has justification and, and sanctification and then we tend to separate them which should not be the case. So we want to look at some of the texts before we jump into the spirit of prophecy for example, we'll start with Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, 1 and 2, where the apostle Paul is writing to us. And I want us to look at the second part of chapter 1 and then 2, where it starts by saying, one, let us lay aside because he tells us that we are to lay aside every weight and the sin which not so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Now, if you look at these two verses, it says that the laying aside of sins is achieved by looking unto Jesus. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that besets us so easily. How are we to do that? It is only by reading, by, verse, by reading up to verse two, continuing to verse two, that that is achieved by looking unto Jesus. He is the one who accomplishes this difficult task of laying aside every weight and every sin that besets us so easily. Now that we have started a race, we have been justified. And there is a race that is before us. That is before us. So how do we uh, run it? By laying aside the weights that are holding us back, the sins that we have, the unchrist-likeness that we have. 
Verse 2 tells us how that is achieved by looking unto Jesus. So often you will find that we read the first part of this text and then we stop reading. And then we, the conclusion is that we must expel sin by ourselves. The idea comes, of course, we've seen that the problem in all this uh, theme that we've been looking at is that self has to come up, that there, this one we can do on our own strength. And therefore, the same trap also happens in this case. Once we read that verse one and not read it together with the uh, verse two, but this is not what Paul is saying. We are to look unto Jesus, the one who launches our faith and inspires us, and the one who finishes that faith as well. He enables us to do what verse one says we are to do. That is to lay aside sin and then to run that Christian race with patience. So Paul, again, states the same, but somehow different. In the book of Galatians 3, uh, verse 3, if you look at uh, Galatians 3, verse 3, Galatians 3, 3, where he says, he asks uh, a question to the Galatians, that are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? I mean, if you started in the spirit, how foolish are you to expect that now you will continue and finish in the flesh? Hmm? So if God is the one who, by his spirit, started this process, started us down this Christian road, how do you think you can finish this work by yourselves, is what Paul is actually asking. So it is the same thoughts. And he is calling them foolish Galatians because that is not how they started. He's reminding them, oh, I know you started, yes, but even to continue, you have to continue the same way you started. That is in the, in the spirit. Now in the book of Steps to Christ, page 69, Steps to Christ, page 69, Ellen White discusses this problem. And I want you to notice how uh, she captures what we are discussing aptly discusses this problem and asks some question about it, where it starts that many have an idea. Steps to Christ 69. Yes, many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. Alone that is without, without Christ. They have trusted in Christ. Notice this sentence. They have trusted because it refers to us those who have been converted, those who are Christians, those who are in church, they have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin, comma, but now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. Exactly what Paul wrote about in the two texts that we've read. Ellen White finishes by saying, I um, mean the quote where I want us to stop, but every such effort must do what? Must fail. Every such effort must fail for a Christian who has been converted, has been justified, meaning he has been forgiven his sins and cleansed, but now he has joined this race, the Christian race. He is alive. He is to continue living for Christ, to think that he has accepted that Christ forgave him for sins, but now by his own efforts, he is to live. Right. We are told that every such effort must do what? must fail. So this is the error that we fall into in this living a Christian life also called uh, sanctification. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, another thought concerning this is also brought out by uh, Paul in this well-known text, 2 Corinthians 3.18, uh, that, but we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to what? From glory to glory. We are changed, Paul is saying that we are changed by beholding Christ. Looking and beholding are activities. We've read three texts. Hebrews 12.1 mentions looking unto Jesus. Here, 
Paul is speaking of beholding his glory. These are works. These are not just mind processes. Each is something that we must do on our side. And when we do that thing, something happens to us. When we look unto Jesus, something happens. When we behold Jesus, something happens. Now let us look at another act that is mentioned by Christ himself in the book of John 15, 4. John 15, 4. Where Christ is saying that abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. So here we have the third act of sanctification. We have seen looking, beholding, and Christ here is speaking of what? Of abiding. These are the three works that we accomplish in sanctification. We look unto Jesus. We behold him in his glory. And then we abide in him. These are aspects of Christianity that seem so simple. But as we said, we are going to look at what the spirit of prophecy says about them in a very interesting chapter in the book, Steps to Christ. It is difficult for us, nonetheless, to practice them. We think we understand them, but not the way uh, we want to see brought out in the spirit of prophecy. So we see from these three terms that faith, this is faith in action. Faith is more than a mental process. There is an activity that is part of faith. And the functions here, we are going to look at looking, beholding, and doing what? And abiding. In the book of John 6, 29, Jesus himself is talking about how faith is an action or a work. John 6, 29, where Jesus is saying that Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, comma, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. So believing on Jesus, Jesus is saying here, is a work of who? Is a work of God. This is a work or activity that we believe on Jesus whom God sent into this, into this world. So believing here, if you look at the words of Christ, must mean more than a mental ascent to the truth. It is more than believing in something or someone. Because as we behold the marvelous love that God has for us, as manifested in Jesus, the response that will come supernaturally, let me say, or naturally, is that we will also respond by loving him who first loved us. We are told that love begets what? Love begets love. And as you respond by, to this love, by loving him, you will want to behold him. Remember, there are two incidences in the Bible where there are those two demonians out of whom Jesus cast so many devils. They begged Jesus to be with them, to allow him to be in his presence at all times. And you find that this is normal because it is normal for you to want to be in the presence of the one that you do what? That you love. Until Jesus had to tell them that go back to the, to the, to the town, towns that you came from. And then minister, tell the people there what Jesus has, has done for you. But it was a difficult thing for them because they wanted to be in the presence of the one who had done so much for them. Then remember the case of uh, Lazarus' sister, Mary Magdalene, out of whom we are told Jesus cast seven devils. He, she always wanted to be in the presence of Jesus, always sitting at the feet of who? Of Jesus. There's a book that is having that title, capturing how she always wanted to sit at the feet of who? Of Jesus. Because it is natural. It is when you love someone, you want to sit with them. You want to behold that person. You want to listen to the words that this person is speaking. You want to savor his presence. And it is most pleasant to you to do that. And it is unpleasant when you are away from that word, from that person. Remember when Christ one day visited Lazarus and Mary and Magdalene had to do what they had to do in order to serve this guest who was Jesus who had come to their home. Mary, 
decided to sit and listen to Jesus. While Martha was busy arranging utensils and preparing meals for their guests who had come and even blamed the sister that the sister was not helping her. And what did Christ say? Luke 10, 42, Christ answers that Mary hath chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. So this, although this work was necessary, Christ is not saying that serving guests is, is not necessary. This is a very good work. It shows that you love your fellow human beings. But when it came to the two, Christ is clear here that Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Christ is saying that this is a better activity and more important than some other things that we think are so necessary to do. Mary did not let the, the household duties crowd out her affection for Jesus. She found time to sit at his feet because she loved him so much. It reminds me of the problem that we have sometimes in our churches where in the camp meetings, you'll find that there are people who will spend the whole time just ministering to the preachers who have come, that we have Christian guests, as if they are guests in our normal lives that you have to prepare means for. And you end up not even listening to what uh, the person is speaking, including cooking on a Sabbath, but that is a story for a different day. Here we are seeing that Christ says that Mary had chosen the good word, the good part, that is listening to the words of Jesus, whom she was responding because she had acknowledged that Christ loved her. So this beholding, this looking, this abiding we are seeing is an activity of love. It is based on love. It is not something that you can try and stir up in yourself and try to do by force, even if it kills you, because you are not interested in it. We do not love that. When you love someone, there is something that is so natural in you desiring to be with them, to do good to them, to always be in their presence. But if you find that we try on our own to do this, then we are bound to do what? To fail. So the solution is, when you find that you have no desire to listen to the words of Christ, the answer we are told that we should spend at least an hour every day meditating upon the life of Christ, especially the closing scene. And the other portions of scripture. That is the problem. It means we are not abiding. We are not appreciating this gift that has been sent to us. We are busy in the things of the world until now. We find that that love is no longer there. We have to force ourselves to try and listen to the words of the one that we claim uh, that we love. There is, uh, in the book Desire of Ages, a very interesting quote in page 675. Desire of Ages, page 675. Because it, Christ was basically primarily speaking to his disciples who were with him physically when he was upon this earth. So since Christ is no longer here personally, how do we, thousands of years later, abide in him and look to him and behold him? Sometimes we think that the disciples had a as a, did have an advantage over us because they could handle and touch Christ physically. And Mary Magdalene enjoyed his company in her own home in Bethany many times. But listen to what Christ uh, says, because he says that it is expedient for us, for him to go away to heaven. So here is a quote that we sometimes uh, do not think much upon. Desire of Ages 675 that begins, I am the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches, Christ said to his disciples. 675. Huh? I am the vine. You are the branches. Christ said to his disciples. And now listen, because the next sentence, by the way, is very interesting, even in uh, terms of uh, the personality of God. It says, though he was about to be removed from them, their spiritual union with him was to be unchanged. Before we continue, Jesus here is saying that though he was about to be removed from them, that is physical, Christ was about to be removed from them. But Eleanor is saying, 
their spiritual union with him was to be unchanged. So the union that they had with him, even when he was with them physically, was not going to be changed. Now, how do you say that the spirit is a different person from Christ? I mean, based on this sentence alone, it shows that there was going to be a change. He was going to be removed from them. But their spiritual union was still going to be with him that was speaking to them, telling them that it is expedient that he goes away. So it cannot be that the spirit now is some different person from Christ. Otherwise, this sentence will not be making sense. But continuing with what we are studying today, it says that the connection of the branch with the vine, he said, represents the relation you are to sustain to me. The scion is engrafted into the living vine, and fiber by fiber, vein by vein, it grows into the vine stock. The life of the vine becomes the life of the branch. The soul dead in trespasses and sins receives life through connection with Christ. By faith in him as a personal savior, the union is formed. The sinner unites his weakness to Christ's strength, his emptiness to Christ's fullness, his frailty to Christ's enduring might. Then he has the mind of Christ. The sinner has come to a point where he recognizes that he desperately needs Christ. And he sees what Christ offers him in salvation. Then he grasps by faith that he has already been given the enormity of this gift in the death of Christ. And suddenly he loves him so much that he would never want to let him go. This spiritual union is formed. Notice it says spiritual union because it has taken us from the sinner up to where the union is formed. Now this spiritual union is formed and there is a desire to read about Christ, to know more about him, to talk about him, to always think about him. There is a desire to dwell together with Christ. This is conversion, which is part of justification as we understand that is, as we commonly uh, talk about, but we want to look at exactly what the Bible says, like we have been doing in this series. So we are talking about sanctification, but this is conversion, which we refer to as justification. So notice we are continuing with the same desire of ages. So what comes next after conversion, after that spiritual union has been formed with Christ? What is the progression from this union to sanctification that we are talking about today? Continuing. She says, the same desire of ages, that this union with Christ, once formed, this union with Christ, once formed, must be maintained. This union with Christ, that is page 676, next page, must be maintained. Now, this is where sanctification comes in. The union has been formed, justification, but the union must be maintained, sanctification. Christ said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. This is no casual touch. You know it is explaining these things so well. And the issue of a casual touch reminds you of that woman who had a problem and pressed through the crowds where Christ was passing and touched Christ, Christ's garment. And the Bible says that Christ turned and asked the disciples, somebody has touched me. This is no casual touch. The disciples thought that what is Christ asking? In this crowd where we are rubbing shoulders with people, what, what, I mean, is Christ serious asking that somebody has touched him? How can we know who has touched him? But this is no casual touch. Virtue, Christ answered, no, somebody has touched me because virtue is flowed from me. 
Something moved from Christ to this woman, resulting in her healing and her spiritual healing also. So continuing, I was saying that up to there, this is no casual touch, it reminds us of that, of that uh, incident in the Bible where there was a touch. So probably she's referring to that. This is no casual touch, no off and on connection. The branch becomes a part of the living vine. The communication of life, strength, and fruitfulness from the root of, from the root of the branches is unobstructed and constant. Separated from the vine, the branch cannot live. No more, said Jesus, can you live apart from me. The life you have received from me can be preserved only by continual communion. Without me, you cannot overcome one sin or resist one temptation in line with the theme that Gospel Sound has chosen overcoming sin. So here we are told that without Christ, without continual communion with Christ, even after our conversion, we cannot overcome one sin or resist one word, one temptation. So here we are seeing that this living in Jesus and abiding in him is the heart and soul of what we are calling sanctification. There is a statement in First Selected Messages, page 389, where Ellen White says that faith is the only condition upon which justification can be obtained. First Selected Messages, 389. Faith is the only condition upon which justification can be obtained. Comma. And faith includes not only belief, but trust. So here Ellen White is saying that faith is not just a belief, a mental, something will happen. Mentally, you will have to accept in your brain which, and heart, and you accept it in your soul. But we are told faith includes not only belief, but trust. Putting your trust now on something, on Jesus Christ. Yes, continuing now in the following paragraph, that many have a nominal faith in Christ, but they know nothing of that vital dependence upon him, which appropriates the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. So we find that we have, many have a nominal, nominal faith in Christ. Nominal means we can believe we have that mental a sense that I believe that Christ is my savior. I have a mental awareness that he died for me. I have a casual experience of some kind of acknowledge, acknowledgement that Christ is good to us, but we do not abide in him. This is what Ellen White is saying. There is no constant communion with him, like the vine to the branches. We do not stay there and constantly trust in him that he can help us to overcome sin and resist temptations. We go off after that and try to do it by ourselves or on our own. Then we fail and think that Christ has disowned us. So this is the problem that we must be able to understand and address because this abiding in Christ is only maintained by a vital living dependency like a child that depends on a parent until they will become a grown up. So our dependency is on Christ is also the same. It has to be there in order to advance in Christian life. And it is for us to better understand it so that at every point of our temptation, we can know that it is not, it is not us. We call by faith Christ to our aid, first through our mind because we were made to use our brains. And that is where communication actually takes place. So we bring to our mind these verses, these promises, and claim them. There is a constant flow of the sap from the roots to the branches to the vine. And that is the connection that we have uh, to have with Christ in our sanctification. In the book of 1227, Christ 
says the following, which we also have to consider in sanctification. Christ says that consider the lilies, how they grow. And notice it says, consider the lilies, how they grow. So we are on the right track, sanctification. The journey started. We were born again. We were justified. But now, that was just the beginning of the journey. The journey now continues. It is growth that we are talking about here. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The lilies never work, but they are growing. We are to consider that. Sanctification has a lot to do with growing. Notice, by the way, another thing is that Christ compares these lilies to Solomon. And to Solomon in being arrayed, dressed, which takes us to the robe of righteousness that we are to maintain after having been justified. And that robe is what we have looked at that text where Paul says that having not my own righteousness, but the righteousness of who? Of Christ. He is to be found having that righteousness of Christ as a robe. This is a very interesting comparison with what we've been studying. So all of us want this beautiful robe of righteousness. And people think that we have to work for it. We have been looking at texts, not read in context, that seem to say the following, that people have to work for this robe, and even statements from the spirit of prophecy. But now we want to read them in context. But here, Christ is saying that we are to consider the lilies in their splendor and radiance. Christ or the creator makes them that way. He not only causes them to sprout into life, but he's the one who carries them on to their splendor and glory, that even the richest person upon this earth and the wisest was not arrayed like the lilies. So we will be like Jesus, whom we are told is the lily of the valley, when we are arrayed in his robe of righteousness, because that is the goal of righteousness, Christ-likeness. Now we want to look at our quotations from this book and texts also. Steps to Christ. There is a chapter there titled Growing Up into Christ that is relevant for today's uh, study. Growing up into Christ in the book Steps to Christ. Now Paul in Ephesians 4.13, prayed that we might all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now this is growing up into Christ. Those who worry about Christian perfection should be able to read this chapter over and over again. So we go to page 68 of the book Steps to Christ, where it starts by saying, the plants and the flowers. Probably sounds like a comment on the comparison of the lilies to Solomon. Steps to Christ, page 68. The, the plants and flowers grow not by their own care or anxiety or effort. Yes, the plants and flowers grow not by their own care or anxiety or effort, but by receiving that which God has furnished to minister to their life. The child cannot, by any anxiety or power of its own, add to its stature. No more can you, by anxiety or effort of yourself, secure spiritual growth. The plant, the child, grows by receiving 
by receiving from its surroundings that which ministers to its life, air, sunshine, and food. What these gifts of nature are to animal and plant life, we are told, such is Christ to those who trust in him. We are to be totally dependent for our lives, like the plants are and the child is to air, sunshine, and food for our spiritual growth. It is receiving that which God supplies that causes us to grow, not our own efforts at growing. It is not by our own efforts that we are to grow. The quote then continues by quoting Isaiah 69, Psalm 84, Hosea 14, quoting scriptures that describe Christ as the one who produces all the elements of growth. They include, for example, everlasting light. That is in Isaiah 60:19. Christ is to be a sun and a shield to us. That is in Psalm 84, 11. In Hosea, is compared to the dew and to Israel. And then in John 6, 33, is the bread of God, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So all these are different symbols of Christ's function as not only the life giver, but the life sustainer in spiritual as well as in physical life. So we, as we take the simple lessons from nature, we begin to consider the, the lilies and how they grow. That should be able to tell us how we are to grow, which is by receiving the sunshine, the rain, and the nutrients that God has provided for our growth, whether it be spiritual or physical, just like the plants. Teaches us something. It is not us to force ourselves by our own efforts to grow. Continuing in Steps to Christ, page 68, she gives another illustration of how nature functions in this respect. Steps to Christ, just down there, page 68, that as the flower turns to the sun, as the flower turns to the sun, that the bright beams may aid in perfecting its beauty and symmetry. So should we turn to the sun of righteousness, that is Jesus, that heaven's light, that heaven's light may shine upon us, that our character may be developed in the likeness of Christ. So Jesus teaches the same thing when he says, abide in me and I in, in you. Just like he's talking about the flower here, following the sun across the sky that it might have its beauty and symmetry. The same way we are to abide in Christ. And this is something that we do not understand. By the way, when you are doing those science experiments in school, you will always see the plants. Whenever I remember one where you put plants in a box and then open some window on the side for light to come in, you will find the plants are facing that side where the light, the light is coming in from. As in, the, they will turn always towards where light and provision has been made for them in terms of what? Of growth, in this case, light. The nutrients are coming from down. The water has been provided, like dew in Hosea and to Israel. So these are some of the things, no wonder Christ was constantly using nature, because that is what we will see. And then it will help us put these lessons in our minds. Now we read John 15, 4. Abiding, abide in me. But now listen to what Christ says in John 15, 15, which is something that we rarely want to consider because it interferes with our, with our ideas about sanctification, about how we are to overcome sin. It interferes with the idea that self has a part to play in this process of sanctification. John 15, 15. John 15, 5, sorry. Christ finishes by saying, for without me, you can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. Hmm? Now, this is a text that is not, it brings us down deep within if we still entertain the idea that there's something that we can do, we can do. We always think we saw, our trap is always thinking that we can do something. There is something for us to do. But he says that without him, we can do nothing. 
Our problem is that like the Jews of old, the commandments are read, the covenant, and then they say everything that the Lord has said we will, we will do in our own strength. So often, even after our justification, our conversion, we always often try to make a frontal attack on our deficiencies. Because remember, we are told that being like growing into Christ, we must be able to overcome all inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil and any other habits that are unchristlike that are in us. So our response like the Jews is that, oh, that is what is required. We give it, we attack it. We attack it by self. We will be able to do this thing to overcome our deficiencies and sins and bad habits. But the Lord is saying, no, don't, don't try that. It will not help. The normal way is not the normal way in terms of salvation. The normal way how to overcome sin is looking unto Jesus, beholding him, abiding in him. Remember we read Jeremiah 13, 23, where it even asked, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. It is not by trying to change this or that habit or external act. It is by a connection with who? With Jesus, by looking unto him. This will change our hearts. It will create a new life. It will bring us new power. Then we will not trust ourselves. We can only put our trust in who? In Jesus. Then those habits will change. So this frontal attack on these habits is not the way. The way is to abide in who? In Jesus, is to behold him is to look unto him. Steps to Christ as we continue. Page 69 from the same chapter. Steps to Christ, 69. You are just as dependent upon Christ. You are just as dependent upon Christ. 69. Where it begins, you are just as dependent upon Christ in order to live a holy life. You are just as dependent upon Christ in order to live a holy life as is the branch upon the parent's stock for growth and fruitfulness. Apart from him, you have no life. You have no power to resist temptation or to grow in grace and holiness. But abiding in him, you may flourish. Drawing your life from him, you will not wither or be fruitless. You will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Of water. So this is the battle that we are still continuing with, especially after having con experienced conversion. That what can I do apart from him? It is like small children, by the way. It even uses that term for the ones who have newly come into the faith, who are still drinking milk. Yes, they are human beings, but they have the potential of becoming adults. So you see the way a little child says, oh, I can do this, I can jump from this table, and the parent is there saying, okay, you, you try and jump. And as the kid jumps and is going to fall, the parent snatches the kid from what? From harm. That is how God is with us. He is always there. It says that in Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. The Lord is always there caring for the tender and little what? Little plant. Regardless of our efforts, like little children, that I can do this. And we are being told, no, that is not the way. It is not by your effort. Just wait. Grow. You will not reach... Uh, grade five before passing grade one, two, three, and four. So take time. And that is how it is in our Christian world, in our Christian growth. The quote continues. Steps to Christ, continuing with the quote. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, our growth in grace, our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, just down there in the yellow, 
all depend upon our union with Christ. It is by communion with him, daily, hourly, by abiding in him, notice these terms that we have gotten from the text in the Bible, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author but the finisher of our word, of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always here in between. He is to be with us, not only at the beginning and the end of our course, but at every step of the world, of the way. Now, this concept of walking with Jesus, of abiding in him, of dwelling with him, now this is the Christian life. There is no growth apart from that. Somehow, when we see failure in our lives, we feel that Christ is more is far away. But in reality, what happens is that we have neglected to do our part in this journey of what? Of the Christian life. We get busy with things of the world. In our own unbelief, we fall into sin. And then Christ seems like he is very far away from what? From us. In the book of uh, Psalms 16.8, this is what the experience of the psalmist led him to, which is wise counsel for us. So he learned this through a difficult experience and he gives us the reason for his success. Psalm 16, 8, that I have set the Lord always before me, always before, because he is at my right hand. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. So this is the secret to a fruitful Christian life. This is the secret to sanctification. So I can resolve that all day that I will stop sin. But it is not the resolution that will make you to overcome sin. It is the presence of who? It is the presence of Christ. Being set always before you. And because he is at your right hand, you shall not be done with. You shall not be moved. But as in the process, once we are converted Thinking that our resolutions will count to something is a big mistake. Jesus is our stability. And it is for us to have faith in him. And it is our faith in him and not our resolutions, which of course also have to be made, that will make the difference in overcoming sin and resisting temptation. If he is there, he will keep me from falling. So too often we think that we must perform and earn this presence. This is what happens mentally in, 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 in us after conversion. That if we try and on our strength and, and do well, then Christ will commend us by coming now and joining us. Then we think that this is the Christian world, the Christian life. But when we fail of producing any good that brings him, then we have failed in our work. And this is what happens to most of the Christians. So in reality, God is a God of grace that joins himself to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for, for us. While we were yet enemies, he died for us. Otherwise, we could never do a thing to be joined to him. He comes down from heaven to meet humanity and joins us and says, I am reconciled to you, be reconciled to me. Then we walk and talk with him because like we've said, we respond to his love and thus we also uh, love him. Now abiding in Jesus has such a depth of meaning that we also need to go back and look at the branches and the vine uh, carefully. We need to examine what takes place to understand what he's saying in that parable of the vine and the branches because it is poorly understood. It says where we had read that this union with Christ in the book Desire of Ages, page 676. We go back and read it again, 676, Desire of Ages. That this union with Christ once formed must be maintained. This union with Christ once formed must be maintained.
this union with Christ, once form must be maintained. Christ said, abide in me, yes, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. Now, that is what we are told here. That abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his spirit. A life of unreserved surrender to his service. The channel of communication must be open continually between man and his what? And his God. As the vine branch constantly draws the sap from the living vine. So are we to cling to Jesus and receive from him by faith the strength and perfection of his own character. Repeating. The channel, let me start from receiving his spirit. That abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his spirit. Not another person, his spirit. A life of unreserved surrender to his servant. The channel of communication must be open continually throughout between man and his God. As the vine branch constantly draws the sap from the living vine, so cling to Jesus and receive from him his, his own character. His own. So we are to cling to Christ with tendrils like that of a vine. And thus, we are to remember, by the way, that plants receive sunshine and rain and nutrients, and by receiving, they grow. So we are to receive from Christ the things that come from his spirit and make us grow. Even, says Ellen White here, the perfection of his own character comes from him. He is always dispensing it to those who will be willing to do what? To receive, to receive it. So in addition, it also says that a life of unreserved surrender to his service. This means what? Giving to others what we receive from him. We know that if we only receive, then you will become like the Dead Sea because we are to be channels. In the sanctuary, in the holy place, actually, where on one side there was the table of shoe bread. And then signifying Christ as the bread of life. And as you partake of the bread, the other side there was the candlesticks. Light of the world. Your word is a light unto my feet. And as we understand these things, we are also to give light to the world. To the world where Christ is saying you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before before men, and the communion also, and prayers as signified in the golden altar of incense. So here, Ellen White is also saying that there a life of unreserved surrender to his service. You cannot receive and fail to do what? To give, you become poisoned. So if you never give away, then it means that your hunger and thirst eventually will do what? We will go away. You must be able to dispense that we we receive, and as soon as you start giving, then your love for souls will grow. Then God will continue giving so that you can be able to do what? To share. You immediately develop a hunger and a thirst. And as you constantly give, you want to receive more, then you become like the vine, producing fruit. You become open channels through which God works, just like the vine that eventually produces what? Produces uh, fruit. So we see here that this unique process is different than many have thought it to be. In Steps to Christ, if you could go back to Steps to Christ, page uh, 70. Steps to Christ, page 70. Where it starts by saying, by faith you become Christ. By faith you become 
Christ. And by faith, you are to grow up to him. By faith, you become Christ. And by faith, you grow up to, to him. By giving and taking, you are to give all. Your heart, your will, your service. You give yourself to him to obey all his requirements. And you must take all. Christ, the fullness of his blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. Summary of what Christian life entails. That by faith you became Christ. You became Christ. First action. You are converted. You are justified. And by faith, you grow up in him. What we are talking about. How do you grow up in him? By giving and taking. You are to give all. What do you give? Your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements. And you must take all. What do you take? Christ, the fullness of all blessings to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to do what? To obey that is required in the first part. Whatever he has, we must reach out and embrace him and take him in, for only by him am I able to do all these what? All these things. So we see here that he is not only my help and strength, by all, but also Christ, Ellen White is clear here, but also my what? My righteousness. He is my perfection. He is not only the enabling power, he is the goodness and the right doing in me. He is the righteousness of God in Christ, in Christ Jesus. So he gives that to me too, and that is perfection. Those come to me as a gift, and my duty or my work is to receive, to receive them. As we partake of the very nature of the vine stock, we also produce grapes like the stock, that is Christ, not like the branch. The parent stock is the life of the person. The branch apart from him has no life. So when we as branches attempt to act as if we are the stock without him, then we encounter problems because we receive from him not only the power but also the righteousness of Christ himself. So the lesson is simple here that we are told in Steps to Christ, page 70. We are to look to the vine and not to the branch. We look unto Jesus, beholding his glory, abiding in him, and not in myself. So when we spend time looking at ourselves, comparing ourselves amongst ourselves, that is when we get into problems. We look at how we are doing. Of course, that is important. That is the function of, of the law also, that we are to check ourselves. It is an individual work. If perhaps you are not in the faith by going contrary to what the law requires, but constantly dwelling upon it for purposes of check of righteousness. If you can do what you are not able to do by your own strength, then it becomes a habit that is uh, dangerous. Our main occupation should be to look at the source of what? Of life. So we are to be good soil and not good farmers. He is the farmer. He is the husband. We are the good soil. He produces the good crop in us. Our hope is not in ourselves, but in him. So we find that we have a problem uh, spending time looking unto Jesus and abiding in him, especially in this day and age where we have so many things that are distracting us. And one way we need to get out of that trap is to know that we are living in the end times. That is, I think, the purpose of the prophecies also. You understand, then it means you have to let go of some of the things. Because you understand that time now, I don't think it's like when it was 100 years. And you can see it. So you, you, 
we are not to be so busy that we do not have time uh, for Christ. And we have, to, we have seen previously how Mary Magdalene always had time for Christ, sitting at the feet of Jesus. It is called devotion. That is where we get the term uh, devotion, because you are devoted to the person that you do, that you love. You cannot be able, you cannot have a long distance relationship because they don't work. You have to be with the person that you love, always savoring in his presence and listening to his words, catching whatever he is saying, because you have this relationship. But it cannot be that you do not spend uh, time because the devil knows, and we read in the spirit of prophecy, where Ellen White, and that is why I really appreciate the spirit of prophecy, how he was going to keep busy the people of God. You know, it was a vision whereby he was taken behind some wall and then he listened to the devil talking to his uh, fallen angels, how they are going to distract the people, especially of God in these last days, how they are going to tie their money by investing in the lands and, and, and speculating, yet it is the end time so that the work of God is also uh, tied up. And of course, the quote that we read, the devil does not wish that this message of justification by faith will be preached to the people because he knows that if it is believed, then his power will be done what? Will be broken. May the devil's power be broken in us by understanding and applying and experiencing what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy teaches about living uh, this sanctified life and how we are to become sanctified. Let us wind up by reading Steps to Christ, page 71. Steps to Christ, page 71. Where it says, that when the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior, and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. The pleasures of the world, number one, life's cares and perplexities and sorrows. Yes the faults of others, even the faults of others, or your own faults and imperfections. To any or all of this, he will seek to divert the mind. So here we are given liquid in the spirit of prophecy, that these are the ways that the devil will constantly work to keep our attention diverted from what? From the savior, in order to cut that union and communion of our souls with who? With Christ. So once we know this intellectually, of course, we now can be able to identify them. Do I care, do I have life cares that are constantly interfering with my devotion, my communion with my savior? Then you have to create time. The pleasures of the world, we have to get out of these pleasures of the world. The faults of others, our own faults and imperfections should not discourage us because that is not the focus. We are to focus on who? On Christ, just like the flowers and the lilies. Then we can be able to do what? We can be able to grow. Continuing with the quote, it says, do not be misled by his devices. Do not be misled by his devices. Yes. Many who are really conscientious and who desire to live for God, he too often leads to dwell upon their own faults and weakness, and thus, by separating them from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory. We should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved. All this turns the soul away from the source of our strength. These are very important words. That we should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fears to whether we shall be saved. Because this turns the soul away from the source of all strength, of our strength. Commit the keeping of your soul to God and trust in him. Talk and think of Jesus. Let self be lost in him. 
Put away all doubt, dismiss your fears. Say with the Apostle Paul, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. Rest in God. He is able to keep that which you have committed to him. If you will leave yourself in his hands, he will bring you off more than conqueror through him that has loved you. Now, this is trusting, not just mental assent, but this is real trust. You do not even think about whether you will be saved because of your own imperfections, but you are committing your whole soul to Christ. He is the one who will transform you by looking unto him, by dwelling in him. And this quote is important because I mean, God knows it is very easy for us to be self-centered. We can be anxious. Even this anxiety that am I going to be saved, it is arising from being self-centered. What can I do? Where do I need to come in? Yet we have been given the real patterns of growth that we are to consider the what? The lilies. We must be anxious so that we can show our value in, in the Christian life. But our anxiety should not be about ourselves. Otherwise, we will not be able to trust in him. Our God is sufficient. He is able to do all these things for us. He can be trusted. We can be able to depend on him. He is the good father. We can lean on him. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. We are to always abide in him, clinging to him like those tendrils holding on to Jesus. And when we have this living connection with Christ, then we shall be able to live, to have a spiritual growth. Now, this is faith. This is our part. This is the work that we are to perform in sanctification, looking, beholding, abiding. It is the whole heart of Christianity. And the Bible tells us that he gives to every man a measure of faith. We are able to do this. We are not able to fight the battle of sin because Paul tells us to fight the good battle of what? Of faith through which we are able to overcome what? To overcome sin. So we keep trusting and keep looking up. This is the clue to Christian living. Then verses like Philippians 4.13, that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, make sense in this aspect of overcoming sin and having a sanctified life. Because apart from him, we have nothing. In most cases, this text, Philippians 4.3, is only used when we have uh, reached a point where we know that we, we need for earthly things, by the way. Students doing exams, this is a favorite of them. Someone did not study, now exams have come, now we are, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth, strengtheneth me. I think it applies here more than it applies, applies in those areas where we quote it in our prayers because we are looking for salvation or provision in terms of temporal things. Let us finish by finishing the quote in page 70 and 71, Steps to Christ. Steps to Christ, page 70 and 71, which sums up the lesson for today, starting by a life in Christ is a life of restfulness. A life in Christ is a life of restfulness. Yes. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there should be an abiding peaceful love. Your hope is not in yourself, it is in Christ. Your weakness is united to his strength. Your ignorance to his wisdom, your frailty to his enduring mind. You are not to look to yourself, not to let the mind dwell upon self, but to look to Jesus. Let the mind dwell upon his love, upon the beauty, the perfection of his character. Christ in his self-denial, in his humiliation, Christ in his purity and holiness, Christ in his matchless love, this is the subject for the soul's contemplation. It is by loving him, coping him, depending wholly upon him, that you are to be transformed into his what? Into his likeness. 
And friends, those are works that we can do. These we can be able to do. He will inspire us to do. Day by day, he will give us a loving prod to do these things. When we are not interested in reading the Bible in devotional time with him, he will prod us. Every morning we wake up, we are to think upon him. We are to ask for his strength for the day, just like we are to depend on bread for life in our physical and temporal uh, life. So this is Christian life. This is faith in action. This is expressing love for him in response to his love for us. And as we walk through life together, you will be amazed at the transformation that is going to take place. Sanctification is not by trying, it is by trusting. It is by clinging and looking unto Jesus. And that is not a distasteful task. Many just revel sitting at the feet of Jesus, like men who did not even want to be taken away from his presence. And remember, Jesus said that if you are forgiven much, then you will do what? You will love much. May our devotion, may our time that we spend with Christ show how much we have been forgiven. Show our love for Christ and enable us to be transformed in this Christian life. We have made it unfortunately so different and it seems impossible because we keep looking to ourselves. We keep trying to make ourselves grow as if a plant has ever made itself grow by its own effort. And we have become so frustrated and think that the Christian life is doing what? Is, and think that the Christian life is actually hopeless. And all the time, our provider in Christ is waiting with all provisions for growth, saying, let me good, give you all these good things to make you grow abundantly. May we respond to these provisions by Christ who manifested the love of God to us and died for us and justified us that we might be able to accept all these provisions by looking unto him that we might be able to be transformed is my prayer this morning in Jesus' name. May we be able to pray as we end this session. Our Father, once again, we come before you to thank you for the time that you have given us. For the text that we have read, Father, speaking unto us how we are to grow further in our Christian life. Father, we have realized once again that it is not us, but it is all by looking unto Christ, by beholding him in his glory, Father, and abiding in him, just like the vine. Heavenly Father, we pray that you may be able to forgive us of all these misconceptions that we have had. Father, because it seems so easy without involving any effort on our part. But how we pray, Father, and thank you for the little part that you have given us, the acts of faith of looking and beholding in the Bible, that you inspire in us, Father, through the faith that you have given to each and every person, Father, in a little measure. Father, may it grow in us, Father, that we might be able to find time, Father, especially in these last days, that you might be able to be transformed, Father, that your name may be glorified, is our humble prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen.